Uh, looks like we have a couple of questions coming in. If you see the hand up, looks like it's working for people, Erica. So uh, let's take the first one from Pratyush Rai. And everybody, if you, will, if you want to turn your cameras on, please feel free to do so. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. And uh, well, thank you, Paul. That was a good presentation um, uh, from uh, Minnesota Wires. Uh, I, the product, uh, about the, the flexible wire with uh, electronics embedded in it was uh, that's that's an amazing prototype uh, brings brings to mind a lot of other things which people are doing so the key question is with all the functionality which is incorporated into the thread or into the wire how do you envision it getting integrated into a wearable uh, textile based form factor when do you uh, Think of it to be, a, uh, is, it, is it something which can be stitched in or it has to be integrated through piping or any other methodology? We do make uh, ribbonized materials. So we will take the eye stretch of this nature and then we'll, we'll actually uh, weave a braid around it. And then so you can stitch it back and forth. So it's almost like an underwear uh, um, feel and, and such but it makes it much more easier to adapt to the clothing. I know some others are actually putting it in the piping, you know, and replacing the spools that they have, you know, uh, just with things that look like the piping and act like it. But, you know, I think a key there is to design it for their capital equipment so they don't have to do any extra work, make it easy for the next guy. It kind of brings to mind the project which was run by Google. It was called Project Jacquard. They had a thick wire like this, which was put into a Jacquard machine. So uh, yeah, this this is an exciting product. And uh, how do you make connections? Like, uh, is there is there a proposed methodology for making connections with, with your wire and electronics? Well, the uh, the ones that have the integrated circuits inside the wire, there's a flex circuit inside there. So you have to design the flex to do the termination. But the real key is to seal it, you know, so you can throw it in a washing machine. And that's important. Now we're sealant experts and we've got capital equipment to take it down to nine meters. Uh, I'm sorry, three meters, nine feet. And uh, so there's a many new technologies and potting materials, soft urethanes, but they seal beautifully. And, uh, you know, so we've been asked to do that for many, many years. So we've got a long history of sealing things. Uh, still, the body contact being worn down via the carbon or via the silver, you know, plated materials, you know, that's a key to longer term washing machines. Yeah, that's, that's encouraging because a lot of times to integrate the go-to material, uh, uh, like we, we, we heard in uh, previous presentations, uh, was uh, to use silver-coated nylon or uh, carbon fiber. So, mm -hmm. uh, but that, that makes for a very big foot, footprint for actually making contact between the microchip sets. Like, let's say you want to put a men's microphone on your garment. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I would be, uh, I mean, uh, just to sidebar it with you at some point of time, maybe during uh, the discussion sessions, I would be happy to, I mean, I'd like to know more about that product. Thank you so much. If, any, if anybody would like a sample too, it's always fun to touch it and feel it. And uh, we do have kits. So just send an email and I'll, I'll uh, pick up the phone and holler at you. And my cell phone's always on. Thank you, Paul. Sure. Are there any other, any more questions? Anyone else has questions? Um, I've got one more question for Paul that, that plays off of uh, the, the previous discussion. Uh, this is Damon Brink uh, from ACI Materials. Um, Paul, when, when you're integrating that into a full uh, e-textile, how do you handle going across seams? Do you integrate that on a, you know, on a full garment or is it just on one, uh, one component? You know, I'm not the garment manufacturer and the in the military, we usually use a TRL or technical readiness level, you know, and I'm selling probably 40 different customers, different varieties of these products. 
Uh, but this one's really at about a five. We make it work. It's been prototyped. It functions. Uh, at the same time, it's not ready for commercialization. You know, we, we qualified for deep space to go to Mars with some of our products. And we understand the discipline of what real validation is. And uh, I'm just saying this functions, uh, but these we make hundreds of thousands of feet of. I'm sorry, I didn't really, uh, we don't make the garments. Sure. We make components for them. I know that in some cases, as far as cross goes, they just go up and over. It, it doesn't, it, it, you know, it's all, uh, some of these are uh, conductive, but usually they're coated, you know, with a very thin, thin um, material. So you would barely even notice that it, it's got a coating on it. Thank you. Sorry. Any, any other questions? Like we have a question from Vignesh. Yeah, hi. Uh, actually, it's for you, uh, uh Just uh, real quick, uh, awesome presentation. Everyone followed to, I, I loved all of it. Uh, a real quick question. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, in terms of medical products, uh, are there any particular uh, design decisions people take in terms of skin adhesion? Because there's been a lot of movement in terms of capacitive ECG and non-contact sensing methods. Uh, do you think we can adopt some of those techniques to reduce the, uh, to, to, to make it more uh, integratable in the field uh, without undergoing the full contact validation? Uh, just wondering if we have any uh, thing to share on that. The best tip that I could give you is uh, pay close attention to the physical therapy industry. Uh, I think two years ago, January 1st, the FDA changed the rules. You no longer have to do a 510K to launch a product into that. So body positioning and rural healthcare that can be made in a disposable, you know, a disposable is a 30 day, 30 day device. Uh, it's much faster to get to market and much faster to get to revenue. I see. Uh, would that would that also include the the connectivity hardware, or uh, or would you frame it more as a as like a replacement, so uh, razors and uh, blades model, so where the control electronics would be reusable, but we send them new electrodes or uh, new textile embroidery uh, parts. Well, on these disposables, it uh, sells for about five hundred dollars. It's a one-time deal. Uh, they, they have some HIPAA issues. So they're sorting through the confidentiality because you're going through Bluetooth. Uh, but the phones are shifting everything. I'm, I'm not sure I fully understood your question, sir. Uh, sorry, Paul. Uh, I just meant, uh, do you in your designs reuse the electronics part and instead just ship them the, uh, the sensing unit? Uh, I, I'm just wondering, uh, I mean, is there any potential for for using the electronics in multiple uh, multiple sensor patches over time? Well, certainly, when we design something, we want to sell more of it, and we typically own the design, so we're motivated to uh, solve somebody's problem, but solve an industry's problem at the same time. Now, we have code and software, and we can make the whole device. But frankly, most of the time we're selling components and parts. I see. Thank you. Good luck. Does someone have a question? All right. I, ha I have a um, question for, for to me. Um, in your topic, can, can we develop e-textiles in a traditional apparel factory? Yes, sure. Uh, thank you for your question. So, so the, the way I presented my uh, presentation is that I was looking at more from <clears throat> from apparel manufacturer perspective. So, I was trying to say that like you can use like existing tools and machines uh, to produce like e-textile in mass. So, for example, like we do have the apparel production setup, right? We do have the the 
the sewing machine, uh, we, we do have like more like automatic machine right now. We have the programmable machine. So we can actually uh, make um, circuit easy. Maybe let's say using a, like a circuit software like Eagle or something, and then you can transfer them using, transform them to a, like a programmable sewing machine or even embroidery machine, right? And then you can stitch them directly on the fabric pieces. So uh, in my PhD project, I, I tried to actually uh, develop a whole trace route using a sewing machine. You know, so because I, I, tr I tried to put components in different part, I showed it in one of my slides as well. Like I put components in different part, like on sleeve, on the back, and then you have the body of like, let's say 54 inch. And then you design the whole uh, trace out using a sewing machine. So it, it made the, did the whole thing with the sewing machine and then you use some kind of like more scalable machine. Like instead of uh, heat iron, we use like a t-shirt press to like sort our components into the textile. And all this equipment on the machines that already exist in the industry. I mean, definitely you can like use more modern and sophisticated machine. You can definitely improve some of the manufacturing process, but you can still use the, the existing tools and machine. Then you can use them to like develop like more advanced e-textile. So I think that, yeah, the answer is yes. You can use like traditional tools and machines that are used in apparel industry and use that as a base platform and then adapt some of the machines out there from electronics industry and try to incorporate, incorporate them and then make e-textile. Thank you. Got, got a follow up along that same line. What's the impact of technology integration into garment in terms of the labor, the equipment, and the costs to manufacture e textile compared to, say, a standard garment? Yeah, sure. So, like, uh, so you asked about like what is the impact of like uh, the integration of technology in terms of equipment. So in terms of equipment, like uh, as I mentioned in my previous portion that you can use like traditional machines and then depending on like how sophisticated you want to make your uh, component or how sophisticated you want to make your manufacturing process, you can have like all those more advanced and sophisticated machines. Uh, and then uh, the cost is also like, since you are integrating electronics, so there is textile and there is electronics. So the electronic component itself are very cheap, but when you, like involve people to work on that, then there is more cost involved. Like the, there is a cost for the components, there is a cost for like the labor. Uh, since uh, the technology itself is very new, like, you know, the, the, it's still in the very, like the beginning phase, it's not very sophisticated, like electronic manufacturing. So, so the, it, even the prototyping takes a lot of time. So if, if it takes a lot of time and it's a lot of the process involved, like manual involvement, like you need manual labor. So the cost is really, really high. Um, and then, yeah, and then you like more uh, skilled people. So for example, if you think about electronics, like you need people who knows electronics can make apparel, you need people who know, knows about apparel. But when you're talking about e textile you need people who have a background in or knowledge in both these fields. So you need like more skilled people to make those things. And also uh, the people who work in the apparel industry, they don't know about like, uh, you know, the circuit diagram, like you have the conductor in between, but uh, in general, they are just sewing different traces, but like sewing uh, or like making seam line, but there are certain seam line that they cannot touch with each other, you know? So there are some limitations there as well. So we actually uh, uh, looked into, we did a study of, uh, for that one as well, try to understand like what is the actual impact of, quant uh, like the impact of technology into clothing. So we wanted to quantify the value. So we saw that like it took around like almost three times higher to like, Three times higher to in terms of cost, and around three times higher, uh, like uh, in terms of time to produce one e textile garment compared to like one regular garment. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah. Do we have any any other questions for anyone? So Corey Lord had his hand up, and then Meg Grant would go next. Okay. Hey. Um, I guess I could open this question up to anyone. It's more a materials question. Um, so for a lot of e-textile applications, emulating a wire with a thread is just kind of a, like a binary operation. It's connected or it's not. Um, but for some applications like wireless charging and RF communication, the properties of the wire matter. Uh, so Given the requirements for durability for washing cycles and things like that, is there a like a preferred material used for the conductive thread for higher frequency applications? I'll give it a, a quick shot. Um, 
if, if you look hard, uh, L-I-T-Z, LITS, where? We sell probably a yeah. million feet into the hearing aid industry, believe it or not, just little by the inch. But they use a, a, a thin polynylanes on each of the conductors. And they're, they're basically putting seven conductors together. Also, they're silver plated. Also, they're typically uh, old school. They used to be beryllium, chromium, and I forget what else. Now they've got a Rojas approved uh, and they won't share their recipes, but they're extremely strong and they're extremely conductive, but yet very, very thin and small. You know, that's what this is with that, that uh, four conductor. And the, the idea of strength comes from the textile. We use a lot of Kevlar and a lot of Nomax. And so you can actually put that inside the material so that as it stops, it'll get a, you know, this will go something like 60 pounds and you can make it much more. It just gets more expensive. Did that help? Yeah, that helped a lot. Thanks. Okay. And then I think Meg had a question. Yeah, thanks. I had a question for Maddie. Um, Maddie, your components look really useful for um, prototyping and making robust testable looks like works like um, prototypes but I'm wondering if they also have a role further along the um, along the line in integrating them into actual products is there a, a, a role there for them oh, thanks for asking me I I would hope that there could be I think that these products, at least where they are now, especially because we've been developing them largely over the summer, are not a place where we've tested them enough for robustness and reliability to go into a consumer product. But I think that over time, if we're able to run all the proper tests and see that somebody can reliably make those connections and reliably integrate and the electronics are, you know, continuing to perform well, then maybe it could and having, you know, having a modular way of making products in the space, especially um, small volume products, I think could be really useful. So my answer is maybe and we'll keep looking into it. Uh, but thanks for asking. Great, thanks. Are there any Hi. other questions? Anyone else's hands up? I can't see. I got, I got a quick, another question for you, Maddie. Um, are there applications outside of wearables for e-textile prototyping tools? I think that there definitely are. I mean, especially for, for our business, I think we've seen that our method of doing e-textiles is good for some products and not so good for others. Um, you know, what, what Paul has at Minnesota Wire, I think it's probably better than our four wire bus when it comes to making a really streamlined medical device that you could put in a garment, for example. Um, but I know a lot of the applications where our technology could be a good fit are in places like automotive or soft robotics or other places where you might need a really soft, flexible circuit to do a function. And a lot of the um, projects that we got from some of the creative technologists we worked with actually weren't garments at all. So we had some um, kind of like graph design architectural projects. We had some um, accessory projects. We had a yogurt fermenting project, which I guess is almost a consumer electronic, maybe. Uh, so I think that that's where e-textiles can really find an opportunity is seeing all that we can do outside of, I mean, there's a lot in wearables, but I think that there's a lot even beyond that. Any any other questions for for anyone? Oh, I have a question. Um, <laughs> perhaps for Paul regarding medical. I wonder if um, if if Paul could talk a little bit about um, the FDA requirements um, that his company. Um, has to deal with. I know it's a huge topic, but just um, maybe some 
gotchas for people who aren't used to working with medical uh, devices and um, FDA? If um, you could talk a little bit about that. Well, again, I we have an engineering staff that actually sells engineering details and services and validation. When we set up a flex tester, we'll set up with maybe a three different durometers of plastic, you know, 65, 73, and 85, and we'll test it. And you can launch a terrible product in the marketplace, but you have to leave a trail on everything you do. And you have to have a justification as to why did you pick that plastic versus this plastic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, there's teams that do this. We we don't sell directly into the marketplace, so we're a component, we're, and we're at their beck and call. You know, we've got uh, guys that'll come in here and take up our flex testers for a week, and uh, we break things on purpose. You know, we we snap things, we we literally destroy things. Uh, one other thing we do do is tribal electric effect, and your chips and your mems are now looking so deep into the body especially with oxygenation and such, and your, your EKG, a lot of the operating table. Shielding is becoming a much greater issue uh, on, for, protected from the outside. Uh, we produce electromagnetic pulse protection for Air Force One. So that's an extreme example. On the other side, anything that moves, it builds up static, and that static creates a poor signal or poor diagnosis on the body. And so you gotta protect both sides. But when we're doing wearables, you know, everything moves. So you really have to be very mindful as to how to test for that tribal electric effect and reduce it with carbon-based materials, typically extruded. I'm, a, I'm just distant from those big guys that, you know, take four years to launch in we certainly work with a lot of smaller companies and, and the biggest guy in the market is right down the block here. He's about, you know, five miles away. So it's a lot of variation. Uh, but I'm, I'm distant from the FDA regulatory requirements other than what they send down on the prints and say, I got to have these tests completed. We then do that and we charge for that service. Oh, okay. So your, your customers um, take the lead and the responsibility on that because they're essentially they're and responsible. Okay, yes, right, that's really interesting, thanks. I got a question for you, Paul, if no one else yes, has their hand up. Um, I think you briefly mentioned that the textile wearable market trends are in rural areas. What are the trends you see in this area? Well, outside of the medical body positioning. That's probably 40% of our customers. You know, like I mentioned this uh, basketball shooting sleeve, you know, uh, just so these guys can test themselves. And they're full of gyros and accelerometers. Uh, some chat a little bit, some give a little lights. But, you know, think of a, a catcher framing a pitch and making a ball into a strike. I mean, they're getting so detailed of all of that. So I think there's a huge growth on just where's your body and what's it doing for training purposes. It's like a Fitbit on steroids for high-end athletes primarily. Yeah, I've, got, I've got one more for you, Erica. I got a good friend that uh, is the number one producer of weightlifting equipment. He sits on my board of directors and he owned the Lifetime Fitness, et cetera, et cetera. Now guess what happened when COVID you know, they just stopped, okay, all of his revenue. And he's about a $35 million company. And he had to flip it into home health care. And with it came set of body positioning sensors, you know, to make sure you're doing it, all the exercise, you know, properly. They're eliminating the trainers, at least they're trying to. And that's creating a whole nother wearable marketplace that we weren't really thinking about. And that's all COVID. Um, we have questions now from Ona and Corey Lord again. So um, I think we have Ona go first and um, we'll have Corey go next. 
Uh, hello, uh, this is Ona Akshari from Jaipur. Um, I had a question to Tamil about uh, manufacturing. Like, uh, what's your experience when it comes to um, integrating components with lamination or different welding techniques like ultrasonic or RF or just heat welding or things like that? So are you asking about what is my experience? Like what, what I think about all this technology? Yeah. So uh, um, in my personal experience, I actually haven't explored that area significantly. Um, so I've been mostly uh, working with the soldering stuff. So uh, uh, I can talk about that, but I, I can see like there are a lot of like, a lot of people who are working on the, the ultrasonic welding and all these areas. So it, it's, I think it's just depending on like, um, for each method and technique, what I noticed in my personal life, there, there are some pros and cons uh, related with this. Um, in my case, I, I noticed like all the things I was making, I was trying to like integrate electronics into clothing and try to make sure they're kind of durable. So I found that in the case, like uh, the sorting was like uh, more uh, like mo the base technique, but I didn't actually explore the other techniques. So I, I, I think I shouldn't make any comments on them, but I see there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was uh, asking, you, I think lamination is one thing that we uh, in my company work a lot with. And I think we kind of found it to be uh, working well with e-textiles because you get kind of really smooth and flat surfaces and the seams can be very flat, uh, so they have comfort and like you have a lot of components, so kind of have uh, that like advantage, advantage there too, to just have a thing, a piece of film or just two layers uh, welded together. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's really makes sense. Yeah, thanks for your question. A, a quick comment there. If you Google rotational sonic welding, there's quite a maturity in that marketplace and it's fed through just like a, a regular fabric and it's very quick. Rotational welding with, with rotational sonic welding. Okay. Thanks. I'll look into that. And, and who had another question? I, I, I forgot who else had a question. That was Corey Lord. Yep. Oh, okay, Corey. Hey, um, I have a question for Madison. Um, I actually help startup companies um, with prototyping and uh, I've talked to quite a few people who have attempted to make prototypes for e-textiles and it's easy enough when you're talking about making it work on a board, but integrating it into the actual apparel is uh, very challenging. So a lot of people get fatigued and they might even reroute and try and make a wearable or some other easier technology. Um, do you, are you aware of any like turnkey like firms or companies that assist people to go from a onboard prototype to an actual piece of apparel? Um, and if you aren't aware of any, do you think that that's going to be a growing market in the coming years? Uh, yeah, that, that's a really good point. I, I've seen that as well, where it's like the the wearable idea is just so hard to actually implement that it like the e-textile garment based wearable is so hard to implement that eventually just gets switched to a hardware device at some point. Um, I mean, uh, we do some of that work for our customers, so everything from the software development to the circuit development to get everything fully integrated into something you can wear and test. There are other groups who do it as well, too. I, I don't want to say anything wrong, but I think that propels a similar kinds of services, but they, they do do a lot of government contracts, but I think they will do commercialized things as well. If anybody's here from Propel, you can correct me. Um, and then also, I, I think like Mayant does that as well. They probably mostly want much bigger customers. But um, yeah, I, I think it's a specialty that's developing because as as we had heard from Tom and Joel, it's like you really have to understand both a little bit to make this work. And so you always have to build a specialized team who can do it. I think it's very hard for somebody, even the most talented engineers to come from outside and just get it on the first try 
how to get electronics and textiles to work well together in a prototyping situation. Um, so yeah, thanks for sharing your experience. It's really interesting. Uh, there was a question from Bajal Patwa. Bajal, did you want to ask your question or would you like me to ask on your behalf? Okay, uh, so Bajal said he has a, um, a similar question. Uh, this is about a process to integrate, which is flexible but, but mechanically strong. Which process is best to use and could be scalable later that doesn't wear out after many washes? I think that one was for you, Maddie. Of course. Um, yeah, I, I think I might also relate a little bit to what um, Pam Abdul was answering as well about Ona's question. But I, we use mostly heat lamination or we use sewing. And both heat lamination and sewing are traditionally used in the apparel industry. So they're meant to endure wash kind of by nature. Uh, and we find that that tends to be both strong and reliable. The interesting thing about heat lamination is that the softest materials that we found, which generally tends to be TPU, at least for us, does have a melting point that can be right on the, um, like right on the cusp for some automotive applications. So for, I think like garment-based wearables, generally they don't have a heat threshold they have to pass, but it can just be something to keep in mind during later processing that you're now adding in a generally lower, like a lower melting point than the textile itself when you laminate something onto it. Just from what um, we've seen. How about you, Amadou, have you seen anything like that? I mean, I, I agree with you, but um, as I mentioned earlier that uh, I have, haven't tried the heat elimination, but we actually did a lot of testing with uh, the washability and the durability of the component. So, uh, as you mentioned, sewing is definitely one of the like the common technique that you use in e-textile, and that's definitely durable, particularly durable. And then soldering, uh, soldering is also used uh, commonly in e-textile. So uh, in our case, like what we try to do is that we took one of the like the common techniques that are already used in the industry, like sewing uh, and soldering, and then try to improve the process. Like how can we make a process that for that works for e-textile, like not you know in general for like electronics, because you also have to need to consider different variables. For example. If you're on a solder, a component is directly onto fabric. Like the fabric has, uh, fabrics are more heat sensitive compared to like electronics. Like, you know, so, but also you need to go to a certain uh, temperature to solder directly onto fabric pieces. So you wanna make sure that you don't burn the fabric, but also you wanna make sure that you get the, the desired, uh, the, uh, the, the connection uh, with the component. So, uh, so from my personal experience, so we, we developed a method where we, uh, as I, I also mentioned earlier that we solder components directly onto fabric, but we use a heat press instead of heat gun. So the benefit we saw on that one is that when you're using a heat press, like it's, it's basically pressing the component directly onto the, like the traces, right? The conductive thread. So it's putting both pressure and also it making sure the, the components are stabilized on the surface. And also, so, so yeah, so we saw that it, it provided a solid connection. And in our case, we provide a washability test to like we put them into a washing machine or dryer, like we left them for like 18 hours. We try to see like what happens to the electronics and the component result like the failure rate is like around two to three percent. So we chose, and we also, and also another thing you can try is that you can use different insulation material. Like right now, silicone is one of the most common insulation material that are used, but also silicone are not that comfortable. I, that's what I found when actually testing with the user. Uh, but there are other like soft material, the fabric based insulation material that you can try. So we also explored that area as well. So we, we tried with silicon uh, with like basic LEDs and we tested with hundreds of samples. We found almost zero failures with silicon, uh, but then, uh, but then that, that was a very binary thing like uh, pass or fail, but if you wanna try with more complicated component, then it might also get a little messy. So you need to have a like more, you know, more durable or solid connection. So yeah, so that's my personal experience. Like, I would say sewing and soldering is, probably the most reliable for now, but there are other techniques that I haven't explored. Yeah. Okay. okay thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Claire, did you want to ask your question or you want me to read it? Well, it's not really a question. I'm just following up from Corey's question okay. to, and, and Madison's response because Maddie you definitely you know, called us out. Um, yeah, we, we are a um, small business based in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and we've had a series of 
uh, Defense Department contracts working on e-textiles. Um, and, and I really enjoy these kinds of conversations because everybody is trying to solve the same problem but from different approaches. And our overall um, view is that uh, we've, we're, we've been trying to collect to create new tools to add to the toolbox that could interact with any of these things that you're talking about. So we're not seeing ourselves as necessarily the total solution provider, but the thought process for how to put those together. And we've developed some specific solder free connection methods. We're using a lot of 3D knitting. We can knit the circuit into the textile. Um, you know, we've done heart rate, specialized heart rate sensors. That doesn't mean to say we wouldn't use other um, off the shelf sensors or collaborate with others on other sensors as well. And having done these uh, DOD contracts, we've got kind of this toolkit and we're starting to do work with uh, commercial companies that might come to us and say, could you do this? And sometimes we're, we're, we may not be the right way to do it, but we can direct them where to go or we can collaborate with someone else on solving the problem. So um, I'm really enjoying this discussion this morning because I've got new ideas from this and new thoughts as well. Um, and I th I'm hoping that everybody else is too. Thank you. I think a, another question in the chat is from Mariana. Um, it's, for, it's for you to move. How do you address certification concerns during prototyping? Sorry, is this question for me? Um, it, it was, but if anyone else wants to jump in for sure, but it's how do you address certification concerns during prototyping? So maybe Maddie, you can maybe share some experience as well. <laughs> yeah, I would be happy to. So I, I guess um, on the certification side, I also feel like Paul might have, you know, he works in higher intensity with higher intensity certifications than we do. So he probably has some better insight. But, um, you know, if, if something will be sold in Europe, it needs CE. If it'll be sold here, it generally needs FTC. I mean, you want some sort of UL battery certification for safety. Um, those are kind of the most obvious, easiest things to figure out. And then it comes down not just to certification, but also for testing for each industry. So I'll, each industry has its own needs and it's understanding the specs there and then running generally third party lab tests to make sure that you're meeting their spec so that they can then continue the certification to take something to market. So I think that's one of the hardest challenges with making an electronic product and bringing it to market for a small business is that you're looking at a lot of money in certification fees and testing fees a lot of the time. Um, and if that's not done, it just, it can't, it can't be sold. So I would say if you have funds for it, then you can generally get those tests done um, by an external lab at Paul. What were you about to say? Uh, my ad, thank you, Maddie, is that leave a trail on everything. You know, you go to mill specs or AES, you know, these societies oftentimes publish, you know, these uh, uh, specifications you can cut and paste, but just leave a trail on everything that you're doing. You know, if you've got a good file, you're protected. And it's, it's good habit. Um, let's see. Another question in the chat. Um, on the current, I guess it's open to everyone. Um, on the current challenges in regards to finding the right polymetric materials. Can you guys discuss what you're up against? Hi, I can comment on some of the materials that we've chosen um, and then pass the microphone. So I, I think when it comes to this industry, as Tom Adul was saying in the user testing, people have very specific feelings about how things feel. And so even if the material is the best technically, if it doesn't feel good, people will decide that it's a bad choice. So it's always kind of a balance between materiality and technical specifications. And we've found that generally people are used to things like TPU against their body. Um, anything crunchy, they don't tend to like. So you have to look for low noise, like high drapeability kind of polymeric films. Um, things uh, like, like curing materials, like silicones can also be challenging. So, um, 
yeah, it's, it's no longer just a technical feat. It's also very much how people feel about it. Uh, what were you going to say, Paul? I was just going to say that our favorite uh, polymer uh, compounding house is RTP. They're based out of Winona, Minnesota, but they've got plants in Brazil, India, uh, about a $400 million company, but they do small batches of carbon-based materials. Um, again, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. I'll be happy to read them all for you, or you can ask live. And I can't see, for some reason, I can't see if you've raised your hand, so. so I don't see any more hands up, Erica, so okay. I think that we I hope they address everybody's questions. If anybody does have questions, please chime in or raise your hand. All right, Erica, then I guess you can wrap up the session. All right. Well, I appreciate everyone's time. Um, and I think the next session after lunch is on the um, how COVID is affecting us and how we're responding. That's, it's a networking section, right, Paul, Chris? <laughs> That's correct. So uh, as I said earlier, we are going to keep this room open. So if people want to talk or chat about things, uh, you're free to do that. Uh, the next plan session, we do have the, the, the discussion that we'll have about COVID-19. Uh, and then our afternoon workshop begins at 2.30 Central. So the times I'm giving, I apologize, everybody, our Central to Standard Time. Um, so 2.30 to 4 o'clock will be material issues and wash factors. Um, we'll have presentations by Chuck Kinzel, Lauren Cantley, and Mary Johnson. So uh, I think that that handles things for our morning workshop. Thank you to the speakers. It's Erica, thank you for leading the session and for introducing and uh, monitoring the, the, uh, the chats and the questions. This is our first time doing this. So you got to be the guinea pig and you were a successful one. So. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> uh, but like I said, we'll keep the room open. Um, as long as you see my camera on, if anybody has questions for me about anything, you can please feel, feel free to ask. I mean, happy to talk about standards, happy to walk people through uh, the eTextiles exchange platform, kind of show um, how to get in there just in case you haven't seen it on your own, anything at all. So, uh, but other than that, I think you're free until uh, the afternoon session at 2.30 or the one o'clock networking session where we'll talk about COVID-19. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Uh, uh, excuse me, Paul. Uh, uh, can this you hear me? Paul? Yeah, hi. I, I just I sent can. you a um, private message. Uh, essentially, I want your email address. That's all. It would be great to connect over email uh, so that we can discuss requirements. Okay. Uh, do you want my email address? Yeah, that would be that would be great. We can go for uh, that. Yeah. P W A G. N E R okay. at M N W I R E dot com. Okay. So P Wagner at M N Wire dot com. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I'll reach out to your email. That'd be super. I, I am traveling today. So be aware. I'm uh, deep. I'm going deep in the woods to uh, hunt muskies. That's a oh. big fish. <laughs> Happy hunting. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Oh, uh, also really quick. Uh, do you see any uh, any promise in integrating this with? Uh, with technical embroidery and developing custom custom sensors in fabric, or, or or do you think all the sensing should happen as part of the wire? I was just curious what your thoughts were on that.
Was that was that question for Paul? Uh, sorry. Yes. Yes, Paul. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Could you could you say again, please? Yes. Uh, I was just asking. Uh, so uh, with the textile embroidery machines and things coming up uh, with what uh, with what uh, Tamidul also presented. Uh, I was just wondering if you see any promise in in merging uh, the technology, such as your wire with uh, with sensing fabric integrated into textiles, or or do you think all of the sensing should also happen through the wire? Well, I'm a wire guy, and I sell <laughs> wire. I do 140 million feet a year. Uh, most of our uh, wire started with being tough and rugged. You know, the comfort came later, but the Army paid us to put wearable electronics on the body, and so they were having cable breakage. So all this technology came back from a, a small business innovative research grant, then some TTR, uh, TIF, uh, Title III money. So we've been very lucky over the years to acquire that. Uh, so I've got a prejudice. Uh, my my goal is to make it as easy for the textile shirt and garment manufacturers to install something. I mean, that's really the bottom line. My, but the, I can tell you some pretty wild applications. You know, our divers are going down to 300 feet and they get uh, uh, hypoxia, like a pilot that gets into a spin and he's spinning so fast he loses blood in his head. And so they want SBO2 to be put on their masks when they, they dive That's that deep. Cool. That's so I never cool. thought of that. You know, these keep people just keep coming up with ideas. You know, we, we make cables for glacier sensors and they put them around 2000 feet. Well, of course, when they, they shift, they break the cables, but not if they stretch. Well, who would know that you'd, you'd get a market out of that? That's cool. <laughs> you know. No, I get it. Uh, also, no, I mean, the fabrics is kind of a newer trend that I see. And they're probably 40% of our customers now in comparison to the last 10 years. Cabling's a, cabling's a real problem even there too. And particularly the stretch part, I think, helps out a lot. At least uh, getting our initial prototypes done. So I'm just, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll connect with you over email. Thank you for dropping the email. Uh, for sure. It. Sounds really interesting. Uh, also, I was just curious. So since you mentioned uh, doing these custom sensors uh, uh, on the, on, as part of the wire, uh, I'm, I'm curious if you guys come up with your own data protocols or do you leverage some existing protocols uh, to, to talk to these different sensors? Well, you gotta devices. be concerned with HIPAA. You know, that's for sure. They'll, they'll shut you down. Uh, you know, the, the, are you familiar with LoRan? Yes. Uh, the, the directional the Wi-Fi. You know, that's becoming much more popular, especially in the rural areas on farming, uh, because they can control it. And, uh, you know, DISA, HIPAA, and the DOD are kind of our guiding lights. You know, for our, uh, we're aerospace certified, AS9100. And you got to go through that process to get anything on a satellite or into a jet. And so that's very tough. That costs us $200,000. And then they audit you every six months. But boy, they take over how you run your company and how you validate, how you teach brainstorming. Does it tie in with your financials? Can you audit all that? It's really, really intense. But, sounds like it. But uh, sounds you know, brutal too. Uh, at the end of it. Uh, thank you, Paul. Okay. Thank you, sir.